<laughs> All right, shall we get started? Yeah, I'd love that. Well, thank you, everybody. Hello, my name is Susan Sokolowski, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm a professor and director of the Sports Product Design Master's degree program here at the university in Portland at the White Stag Block, and that's where I'm talking from today. The Sports Product Design Program, just to give you a little bit about our mission, is to develop graduates proficient using scientific theories and creative problem solving methods to design products that push boundaries in sport and society. And you may never have heard of us, we're a new program at the university, and we will be graduating our fourth cohort this Saturday. And tomorrow we will be hosting thesis reviews. So if you're ever interested in coming to a thesis review um, to see sports products, um, you can Instagram us at UO Sports Product Design. I'll put that in the chat. And you can also email us directly and I'll put that email address in the chat as well. Attending reviews are a great way to support students and to see the great work that our students are creating. And especially this year, we're very proud of their efforts. Now, before we get to the main event, while you're all here, is I wanted to cover off on a few housekeeping details. So if you're new to Zoom, we'd like you to keep your audio off so we don't capture any background effects. And also we'd love for you to ask questions. And so if you are familiar with Zoom or not familiar with Zoom, if you look on the bottom of your page, you will see that there's a chat function. And in that chat function, you can send us questions and we'd love for you to do that. And we will ask questions um, at the end of the conversation that we have today. And without further ado, it is with great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Adrian Parr. Adrian is our new Dean at the College of Design at the University of Oregon. She's joining us from the University of Texas at Arlington College of Architecture, Planning and Public Affairs. So let's give Adrian a kind Zoom applause Hmm. to welcome her here today. And in the chat, feel free to say hello and tell us if you're a UO alum or what program you're involved with, the year you graduated, or if you're just a friend of the College of Design. We're so happy that you could join us here today. And with that, I'm going to talk with Adrienne and we're going to um, learn all about her great background and what she's planning to do here at Oregon. And so Adrian, it's so lovely to have you. It's great chatting with you today. What I thought we could do is let's start out a little bit about your background. What was it like growing up in Australia? Oh, it was super fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in uh, Sydney, in the heart of Sydney, and uh, I went to public school. Uh, I was uh, an only child, so uh, I got to sort of explore the city a lot in my, my free time as a way to sort of kill time. And then on the weekends, we have a holiday house up in the Blue Mountains, which is right in the heart of um, where there's extensive national forest and uh, the Three Sisters rock formations, with, which have these incredible um, Aboriginal legends around the Three Sisters that were turned to stone. Um, so our home up in the Blue Mountains was very close to all of that. So the forest was my playground on the weekends. Um, and if we stayed in the city, I was, you could always find me down on the south side of Bondi Beach, uh, enjoying the sunshine and trying to evade all the tourists that used to come in in busloads uh, as Sydney became uh, an increasingly popular tourist destination. So I had a, a fantastic time growing up in, in Australia with uh, sunshine, lots of laughter um, and lots of exploration, really. That sounds so great. I think what many attendees may not know today about you is that you were a child of a performance artist, Mike Park, and the niece of the contemporary multimedia artist, Julie Rapp. Mm -hmm. That must have been so incredibly inspiring as a young person. Can you tell us a little bit more about them and what it was like as a child being surrounded by amazing cre creativity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so dad's, you know, if anyone <laughs> looks him up, he's a fairly intense performance artist and body artist. Um, and 
you know, we spent, a, I spent a lot of time in the studio actually with him as a child. Uh, as I said, I was an only child and he also has one arm. So when it came to sort of making a lot of the installation works that later went on to uh, the Venice uh, Art Biennale, he, he showed there and represented the country with um, his Black Box series, which was this amazing you know, black cube in the middle of the room and you'd look through a little peephole and as you look through to the peephole you had this sort of other reality emerge which was a variety of sort of real bodies blended with life-size cibachrome photographic uh, images of members of the family um, so I, I actually helped him make that black box so I had two weeks off of school doing that and I thoroughly enjoyed that my job was to hit the hammer and he held the chisel and, and I helped him chisel out the joints um, and the treat for that was uh, a coconut cupcake at the end of the day and dad would sit there and watch some cricket and wind down and I'd eat my cupcake so um, it was pretty fun actually uh, spending a lot of time with him in the studio he also um, for those of you that are in the arts uh, he he collaborated and worked and was friends with a lot of some really interesting artists so people like Amrina Abramovich and Yule uh, you know spent a lot of time in our home and with me while I was growing up and then when we went to Europe for exhibitions and biennales um, had the good fortune of spending time with them and folks like um, Arnef Rayner for a period uh, Laurie Anderson uh, the big joke in the family is that she babysat me for a period in, in Paris at the at the Biennale there when he was he was there. I have vague memories of that. I remember her playing her violin and doing her first sort of spoken word violin combos that in the early days. Um, so it was a really it was a it was a pretty sort of magical childhood in a lot of ways. Um, and then Julie, his sister, so the rap is pa back to front, double R A P. Um, she's uh, well. Uh, she's a, a fiery lady in, and who does a lot of multimedia uh, body performance photographic kind of work. Uh, so she was in the studio a lot doing her photographic pieces and, um, you know, I would wander between the two houses uh, a lot. So if I wasn't next door with her, I was in, back in our house again. So she's also spent quite a lot of time in Europe sort of traveling and I've had the opportunity to catch up with her in all kinds of different places around the world. Um, and she's, you know, when I describe her as fiery, she's a, a single woman, she's never had any kids. And I'm sort of like, her, her main niece. We, we also look a little bit like sisters. A lot of people mistake us for being sisters because she was uh, quite young still when, when I was first born. Um, she comes over here to the States and, and visits me quite a bit. So hopefully at some point folks will get to, to meet her and, and hopefully dad will be able to make it over at some point. But at the moment, Australia's in lockdown and they, they're saying that that'll probably continue to, till next year. But what it did do for me was it gave me a very intimate understanding of the practice of making. And so whilst I'm not a, a practicing artist myself, uh, I write about art and I write about architecture. Um, and I'm sort of involved, my training is in cultural criticism, but having spent a lot of very hands-on time in the studio meant that um, I have a deep appreciation for uh, what artists do, what, art, what designers do. I mean, Julie, a lot of her work is the result of really, really close collaborations with folks that are really technically savvy and, and other sorts of um, folks from the design fields. So in that sense, you know, always being listening in as a kid listening in to all these conversations about you know the role of contemporary art um, as as both a, a cultural practice but also the sort of the social potential of art dad's work has been very sort of socially and ethically and politically driven in many ways um, and so I think I was really fortunate to be able to hear all those kinds of conversations growing up and it certainly went on to inform me and, in, and my own thinking um, and it was a very sort of formative period for me intellectually as well yeah yeah it, it's almost like you went to college as a very young person um, but speaking of college, um, talk about, um, so you grew up surrounded by these fabulous artists. Tell us about what you studied at university and where you studied. 
So uh, I was a little bit miscreant at first, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I finished high school quite young. I was one of the youngest ones in university. Actually, I was the youngest in the first year. I was 17. And uh, it took me a little while to try to find my feet. At first, I, I thought I wanted to go into performance uh, and into theatre. So I actually started at the University of New South Wales and I spent a few years um, in the theatre program there. And I realised that that was not necessarily something that, um, well, I don't think I was good enough, quite frankly. And I decided to take a little bit of time off and just sort of explore the world to try to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And then I went back to, to university and I started studying um, experimental sound composition. And uh, I was then, uh, went to Florence and I was, uh, you know, I did a study abroad program, uh, an art study abroad program, actually, in the history of art and contemporary art. And I finished up in Florence for a while where I continued to study uh, experimental sound composition there and uh, had the great fortune of, of meeting and spending some time with um, the late, uh, uh, good God, hang on, John Cage, he came to visit for a period so that was a really um that was a really special moment for me and i realized at that point that you know i i was not necessarily someone who was going to be making art and and making my own sound compositions i was probably more adept at writing about sound and the arts as cultural forms of practice um and i was also very interested i started gaining a deep interest then in what it means to sort of how to how to sort of politics and um, ethics intersect and align with um, the various you know cultural practices such as the arts such as music such as performance and architecture and so it was there that I started to move more and more into uh, philosophy and um, aesthetic theory and I had been always studying that alongside doing these other things but I always thought to myself what on earth can somebody do as a philosopher like what's a job for a philosopher um, and then eventually actually both my aunt and dad and my mum said to me just do what you love and it will fall into place so if that's what you think you're really good at and you love doing that something will will happen as a result of that and I'm really really appreciative that I got that advice um, and that started the journey of me really focusing my studies on philosophy, aesthetic theory, and cultural theory. And um, I went through Deakin University. Uh, I then got a scholarship to do my, my master's. I finished that. Um, and then I got another scholarship to go to Monash University where I started my studies for my PhD. Fantastic. So how does one go from studying philosophy and cultural studies and aesthetics to going to environmentalism? Okay. So that's a good question. <laughs> um, so the first, uh, well, I, I think let's if I backtrack. So my PhD was on um, Leonardo da Vinci and his notebooks in particular. And so what I was intrigued about with Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks was the sort of transdisciplinary nature of his work, how he moved from, you know, the practice of art making uh, through to studies in urbanism, on to studies in engineering, um, and also studies in optics, and how these things all informed one another. And a lot of his studies were also environmental studies. So one of the pictures that I found really intriguing was one of the sketches that he made in his early 20s of um, the hillside uh, close to where his uh, family home was. And I realised when I looked at that um, picture up close and I had the opportunity to actually hold these images in my hand and have a magnifying glass to go over them I realized that that was really like the first impressionist picture because you could see that he was sort of holding the pen at certain points as he was trying to capture wind flows and that sort of that that really only happens if someone's doing this in the live right um, and so from there I, I really do think I started to become much more sensitized to you know, the ways in which artists are, are, are grappling with environmental conditions and the fluctuations of environmental conditions as the premise for, for their practice. 
And these then reappeared as the backgrounds of many of his famous pictures and his studies of wind formations and water formations all went on to become the basis for, um, you know, all those beautiful kind of hair drawings that you see. So there's this overlap, the sort of the difference and the repetition of natural forces that infused a lot of his work. Um, so after my PhD, I was uh, recruited by SCAD uh, to, to go over there and to lead their graduate uh, program in the art history program in um, uh, art and architecture history and theory. And it was there where um, I sort of returned to work that I'd done in my master's thesis, which was on the problem of representation and what happens with memory when, when you have a collective memory and it becomes one that's traumatic and it therefore is very difficult to, to re-represent. So what's this act of translation? And um, so I was looking once again at sort of transdisciplinary ideas as I explored that. And the book became the basis, that study became the basis for um, one of my, it was my third book and it was called Deleuze and Memorial Culture. And where I looked at, you know, this issue of how collective trauma is represented and how is it uh, represented and how does it become part of our um, collective imaginary and the environment within which we live. So there I started studying memorials um, and I, I looked at spontaneous memorials in the landscape and I looked at the ways in which different mediums come together um, to, to form a whole variety of memorials around the world, really. And that then pushed me further and further into studies into the landscape and into the environment. And then out of that book, um, I started to think more closely about issues of sustainability culture um, and the ways in which, you know, environmentalism as a whole was starting to be appropriated and um, how it was being put to use by, by large corporations and other entities and sort of what constitutes a sustainability culture. And you want the sort of popularization of it because that's important, but then as it gets popularized, um, what happens to it as it gets sort of watered down? Uh, so that led me into the trilogy that uh, I then published, which was Hijacking Sustainability with MIT. Um, and that book led on to the, the second book, which was The Wrath of Capital with Columbia University Press. And then the third book in the trilogy, more recently, which was called A Birth of a New Earth. And so the ending of one book really, you know, opened up more problems than it solved, which then led to the writing of a second book. And with each iteration, I became increasingly more and more um, caught up in, in the environmental movement and interested in different forms of environmental activism and not just sort of sustainability culture. So the second book was very much about sort of environmental politics too. And that aligned closely with the appointment um, with, the, with UNESCO. So I started moving more and more into the area of policy making. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's amazing how everything starts to interweave, right? As we work through our careers and how all these different things that we are influenced by kind of take us on our journey to what we are doing. So you went from SCAD, right? And then I think you moved a little north, right? To Ohio. Do you want to talk a little bit about your time there? Yeah, that was great. I had a fantastic time at the University of Cincinnati. So my husband, Michael Zaretsky and I were then recruited to by UC um, and we joined uh, the, the College of Design, Architecture, Art and Planning. I have to think of the acronym. We just call it DAP. Um, <laughs> and uh, we spent 12 years there. Yeah. So uh, Shoshana was born right at the beginning of all of that. So she's uh, 15. Yep, that's right. 12. I'm doing my math here. And um, I was uh, in the architecture, uh, the School of Architecture. Michael was in the School of Architecture. And then half of me was also in um, social sciences and humanities. Once again, I needed something that would allow me to be able to have a variety of voices and a variety of practices that formed the dossier for, for tenure later on. So 
you know, I work <laughs> at the intersection of cultural theory, uh, feminist and gender studies, you know, architecture and art theory, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had an appointment that could feed all of those interests. And then, you know, the University of Cincinnati, I was lucky to uh, be appointed as the director of the Taft Research Centre. Um, and I spent my last, last five years at University of Cincinnati in that role and the Taft Research Centre, that was a perfect uh, role for me to move into at that point because their goal was to increase the sort of transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, research focus of, of programs coming out of the research centre. So I thought, you know, that this was right up my alley. And uh, the research centre was uh, the result of a really generous uh, gift from the former President Taft's family and still members of the Taft family uh, served on that board. So I had a really, really uh, fun period in that role. And that was also when, you know, a lot of the UNESCO work that I was doing was really starting to kick in uh, full swing. And uh, that's when I started also making the documentary films whilst I was in that role. And then after that, uh, that appointment was coming to a close after five years, and it always then would cycle back onto another faculty member to be um, selected for the role. And I was sort of at one of those intersections again, you know, am I going to return to faculty and continue doing this work, or am I going to go into another leadership role? And that was when a search firm reached out um, and asked me to apply for the position of Dean at the University of Texas Arlington in Dallas, Fort Worth. Yeah. Fantastic. And what did you do at, um, at the position in Texas? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was great. I had wonderful faculty, really sort of engaged students, and um, I was really happy to be taking on that role. And basically, you know, I think there what what they had was some really good programming but they really needed to improve their rankings well they weren't even in the rankings at the time when I came so I really focused hard on on getting them into the rankings and I feel really happy to say that by the time I finished with with them that they were in the rankings and uh, in the top 20 so uh, those programs were, were left in good shape and then another thing that happened while I was there is um uh, I had been invited by um, the Venice Architecture Biennale folks at the European Cultural Centre to, uh, you know, be part of their exhibition with the films that I'd made that I'd mentioned, Susan. And instead of doing that, I went back to them with a different pitch and said, you know, rather than show my work, I'd be more interested, if you're interested, <laughs> in letting me curate an exhibition um, on uh, this idea of watershed urbanism. And uh, they ran with that idea they said yep go for it so I ended up with uh, three three rooms uh, and one of the initiatives that I did at the university was to create a variety of uh, interdisciplinary research teams that were a mixture of landscape architecture architecture planning and folks in civil engineering to to do some speculative projects around ways in which urban development might take place throughout the trinity sensitive you know, ecological system of the Trinity watershed, how that will could take place um, in much more hydrological and ecologically sensitive ways. So students and faculty were doing these um, speculative projects. And then I worked with members across the city uh, to also feature some of their projects that they were doing. So we had both real and speculative projects that made the basis for, for that exhibition. Um, COVID hit, and as everybody knows, everything went on to pause. Uh, so that was a little dramatic after all that heavy lifting, but um, happy to say that that exhibition has, has now opened um, and they will be doing um, virtual tours of that exhibition. So that was one of the big things I think that I did while, during my time there, in addition to sort of, you know, getting programs through accreditation and getting rankings done, increasing, you know, tenure track faculty lines and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. That's great. And the other thing you did during COVID is you interviewed for a new role and you joined us here in Oregon. So now you're here at the UVO. Tell us a little bit about what attracted you to the university and the College of Design. Well, you know, to be brutally honest, I was not looking for, <laughs> for a position. Um, and I was happily doing my thing in, in DFW. And uh, then the search firm reached out and said, you know, would you be interested or do you know anyone? Or no, actually, do you know anyone who'd be interested? And uh, I wrote back and said, I'll think about, you know, who I know. 
and then they wrote back and said, would you like to have a conversation? <laughs> um, and Michael said, I think they're reaching out to you, hun. And I said, oh, okay. So uh, then I had a lovely conversation with the search firm and, you know, Oregon, the University of Oregon um, is a place that is home to many of the folks that I've always looked up to. Um, a lot of the work that I've done, um, either references work that's been produced by faculty here, or um, it's the result of, you know, conversations that I've been lucky enough to have at various conference um, uh, outlets with faculty who are here. Um, and so their work has informed and inspired me in my own work along the way. And so really, you know, the University of Oregon was sort of like a dream job because it's a good fit for me. And it's also a good fit for Michael. Um, I don't go anywhere without my hubby. Uh, so for the two of us, uh, it really was a terrific match. Uh, and to also be in this part of the world uh, as well. We have a lot of family through here, through this part of the world. So we were excited on a variety of levels, both professionally because of the longstanding environmental reputation of the university. Um, and also it's longstanding um, reputation around sort of issues to do with um, equity and inclusion. Um, and then, of course, for personal reasons. So it was really a good fit on a variety of counts. Um, they had me out here for the, the, what is it called, the shortlist interview, where about 10 people get brought out. That was in March, just before everything shut down. Uh, so everything was put on pause. And uh, then I, I had my virtual on-campus interview uh, last year. I think that was around October, if I remember correctly. And here I am. So I've moved during COVID. It's all working out. I'm loving being here. Got this gorgeous view. Like we were lucky enough to find a house, which is not so easy in this part of the world, I've discovered. <laughs> but uh, we're happily settled in. So thank you for asking. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now, if my calculation is correct, I believe you've been in the role for about 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. What is the way forward and what opportunities do you see with the college? Oh, there are so many exciting things that we can be pursuing together. Um, and I think maybe for the purposes of this audience, um, I'd be interested in talking more specifically about the Portland campus, um, if you think that's appropriate, because yeah. I've been going up there every couple of weeks. I think there's enormous potential to be growing out uh, the programming at the Portland campus. I think, uh, and Justin, He's here. He's on the call. He's been having me bug him a lot lately. He's been very patient with me. Um, he's taken me over to Albina and I've been looking at all the great work that they're, they're doing there and meeting some of the community um, folks who are part of those projects. But I think really with our programming at Portland, we, could become, we can become much more involved with the city, um, with our neighbours, and how does that then inform the kind of programming that we get to offer? Uh, some of the ideas that Justin and I've been talking about is, you know, perhaps it might be interesting to start exploring a community design centre that brings together a variety of the disciplines that we offer within the college, but also as a platform to have more meaningful engagements with, with the community. Um, perhaps there's scope for us to have, you know, practicum uh, integrated into uh, our, our curriculum in some shape or form so that our students are getting out into the profession more and um, actually working with the many firms that uh, have both our alumni there and also have many of the friends of the colleges working there. I've been meeting with uh, a lot of folks from the firms over the last uh, 12 weeks and have um, really enjoyed those conversations. I'm trying my very best to understand what it is that uh, Portland would like to see happen with the programs that we have on offer and also exploring new pro program um, opportunities that we could potentially offer. Uh, I see Jane Gordon's here, our Vice Provost of the Portland campus. So maybe there is programming that we can create that's interdisciplinary programming too, that can capitalize upon the different colleges that have a presence uh, within the Portland campus. So I think there's huge potential for us to be exploring with everybody that's there in Portland. Um, and I think there's also a huge potential for us to um, have deeper relationships, not just with the profession uh, but and community actors, but also, you know, I'm interested in, in 
having a deeper friendship with uh, folks at PSU. So I plan to be reaching out to folks there to see ways in which we can better collaborate. Um, and perhaps some of the things that we can be doing there is, you know, collaborating on conferences, for example, together. Um, so that we both capitalize on uh, different audience bases and um, work on ways in which we can better integrate ourselves into the city. So I'm excited to, to pursue that kind of work and um, to talk further with Jane Gordon about how we might realize some of those ideas. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, we're so excited to have um, such a great energy around Portland and new things to think about. I think there's also some folks on the call that are from outside the Portland area. What are you thinking about for College of Design in Eugene? So with the College of Design in Eugene, I mean, obviously the first few things are, you know, I've got some nuts and bolts issues that I've got to take care of. And I think those nuts and bolts issues will probably take up a lot of my time in the first year or two. I want to improve the rankings uh, of our programs. I think um, in many ways, you know, we're, we're doing well, but uh, similar to what I found in my last role, um, we so deserve to be ranked higher than what we are. I mean, they're doing amazing work. And I also want to figure out a way in which all of the great research that's taking place by many of our faculty members can better align and inform what's taking place in the studios and classrooms. I mean, uh, Kevin van den Weilenberg, for example, all the excellent work that he's been doing um, during COVID around, you know, uh, transmission of, of disease on, on surfaces, for example, the Torwood Institute with mass timber, I think we're really able to be even more at the forefront of research around that kind of work. Uh, we're already internationally recognized by say, you know, folks in Germany who are also at the forefront of that kind of research. Um, I think we need to make that work more visible. So the other goal that I have is to really show off all the great research that's taking place and all the, the things that our students are involved with to be louder, to be more visible, more audible with all of that. Um, our, our students recently in, in architecture just were awarded two awards at the Solar Decathlon. And um, this is two years in a row that they've taken out the main award as well as a follow-up award. Um, they've broken the records, 20, 20 years of history of the Solar Decathlon. Like we need to be really loud about this kind of stuff. Um, Nico Larko and Mark Schlossberg are doing really fantastic work with SCI um, and Urban Next. So I'm very excited about about figuring out ways to better support them. Um, so how do we become louder and more audible about our research, about the great teaching that we have to offer? How do our students get out into the profession more so that we have more practical and experiential uh, learning? And how does that research that's taking place inform more what's taking, taking place in the classroom? And then community engagement. I think that's a really, really important piece, uh, given the strong focus on environmental initiatives and inclusion and diversity. Uh, we have, I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, the Mellon grant that we've just uh, received and the work that's going to be taking place there as a result of that around, you know, climate change and uh, diversity and equ equity and inclusion. So we have a lot of capacity uh, to be having more meaningful relationships with our uh, community members and our neighbours and our friends throughout the Pacific Northwest region. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. I think the College of Design at the U of O, there's such amazing talent and such diverse diversity of the things we do and having you here is such such an honor to be able to move forward with you in in this next adventure right yeah um so what i wanted to do is now move to questions from the audience um if you have a question and if you haven't posted it yet feel free to do so now what i'll do is just um go through the chat Adrian, you have lots of welcomer, welcomers. <laughs> um, we have Alec Holser, Ellen Scott, Robert Hastings, Gabrielle Dominic, Regina Lawrence. Regina, you're very excited about our Portland presence. So that's really that's exciting. That's great. That's, I'm happy to hear that. Regina's from um, School of Journalism, one of our partners here. We have Joanne Dietz and Charles Bruckner, uh, Michael 
um, Donald Davidson, Mark Brunner, Donna Davis, also from School of Journalism, Melina Pastos, Shelly Gourlay from Sports Product Management, also here in Portland, and Jane. All these folks are sending their regards to you, Adrian, Jennifer LaBelle, Lindsay Peterson, Paula Martin from our library. I see Michael Brown, you're here here today too, which is so great. Aisha, uh, Raf Beck, Michael Brown also works with Paula in the library. Hmm. Any questions? Oh, and we have Robert Voltz. Robert, you're from the, you're a board member on the Frank Lloyd Wright house. I love that house. It's so amazing. Hmm. And I'm so pleased that it was able to be saved um, way back when. Um, and we've got um, James Tuttle. He works in our sports product um, design nucleus lab. So I don't see any questions here for you. Um, oh, here we have a question. How can alum help support the college um, with our rankings? Ah, well, many of the rankings uh, require folks to, um, well, our alumni to be uh, filling out a survey and the the survey really explores their experience that they've had within our programs and how it sort of set them up for success and it's great that you've asked that because uh, currently the design futures council is uh, collecting all that information from alumni and from professionals who employ our alumni for uh, at least the architecture, landscape architecture and interior architecture programs. Uh, so if anyone on this call is either from one of those programs or is in a firm, uh, for an architecture, landscape architecture and interior architecture uh, firm with any of those uh, disciplines as part of the firm uh, and you employ our students, when they graduate, it would be fantastic if you could actually fill that survey out. It would only take 10 minutes. Uh, I think Kyle or Tina would be able to send you an update on that. So yeah. yes, I yeah. see Kyle knocking, nodding his head. That would be a huge help, huge. Yes. Part of the issue has been that we haven't gained traction around that. So I've been working hard to send emails out and write letters to people. And when I meet with people to certainly uh, bring, that, bring that up and encourage folks to, to please help us out by, by filling the survey. So that's one simple thing that, that people can do, but it goes a very, very, very long way. So um, if any of you are interested in that, yeah, please write the, uh, the link down. How do we do that, Kyle? How yes, Kyle, Kyle has posted that in the chat. So okay, right. um, the design intelligence ratings, the architectural professional, there's a link there so you can copy and paste it. There's an interior architecture design art um, professionals, and then there's a landscape architecture professionals um, site too. Mm -hmm. So um, please, um, if you're in those fields and you want to provide your um, feedback, please do so. Um, Jane has a follow-up question. Um, what have you heard from visits with architects that informs the College of Design direction? Mm. So the big thing that is the big take home uh, for those in the, the profession that are coming, uh, so not so much sports product design, Susan, but uh, for the architecture side of the equation, folks are saying, you know, we really need to reinvigorate design excellence throughout our program. And a lot of that has to do with uh, getting our students out and into the firms more and getting them out and into firms earlier. So at the moment, I've been exploring ideas around, uh, well, a variety of things. So the first one being um, having studios in firms where students have access to a variety of people working in the firm who all pop in and out and serve as the sort of the, the crit or the professor, but rotating professors. Um, and uh, it makes it much easier if the studio is taking place in the firm. And I did this in DFW and it worked really, really well. Um, and so one of the firms that I've spoken with has been very excited about that idea. Uh, the other one, the other idea is um, ways in which we might also uh, have sponsored studios. 
So this is more about students working on real, real projects um, and doing a lot of the design research side of things and working to a very specific brief that the firm um, gives us and then they serve as the backbone for, for reviews and so on and so forth. So that's another model that I've been exploring with some of the folks in the profession. Um, and uh, there are alumni of ours who are also interested in that sponsored studio model. I've also done that both at UC, at DAP, and um, at the University of Texas at Arlington, the sponsored studio model. And they often produce this really um, beautifully designed uh, little booklet that sort of summarizes visually all the research that's taken place in the, in the studio. Um, and firms have found that also very useful. But we've also done that with community partners too. For example, the city of Arlington, we did something like that and um, they worked on a library project um, and that project part of that project now is um, going out for bid and they're going to build it so there's ways in which we can be doing that um, and then you know there's also been with community uh, partners discussions around issues of houselessness and how what might we be able to put both our imaginative and research skills to work to help brainstorm ideas around that um, and be part of sort of reactivating parts of the city and how might design be part of that process. So um, there's been a, a lot of really interesting and informative conversations. And if anybody in this group um, would like to arrange a time to meet up with me when I'm in Portland, please feel free to, to reach out to, to Kyle Harris. Um, and he'd be more than happy to organise a time that works for all of us. Kyle, maybe you want to let, let know fo folks know how they can contact you. That would be great. And I'm doing a lot of information gathering. Um, and it's really, really helpful when I have conversations with a variety of individuals, alumni that are working both in the profession or that might be working for nonprofit agencies or with other community kinds of groups. Uh, I'm really, really op open to having those uh, conversations because they're always tremendously informative in terms of shaping the vision and the strategic plan that we'll be putting together in the coming year. And that's something that I definitely want to be working on with the faculty in conversation with our alumni. You've been very busy so far. <laughs> Also, <laughs> also joining us today is Jean Senechal Biggs. Um, she is um, part of the ASLA Oregon chapter and she's a, a trustee. Um, and she says that um, we have a really great student chapter. So maybe that's a really great way to interface too with um, folks in Portland as well. Um, and yes, then- Good. Have we got students of ours in the student ASLA chapter? actively involved I don't, I don't know that yes organization. yes very much yes very much so we have a great student chapter they put on a great event uh earlier this year um so that yeah, yeah we have a and we have a strong connection with the between the professional chapter mm -hmm. in the community and the students so that's great yeah. maybe jane we can meet at some point when i'm up in portland i'd really love to chat with you more about that yeah for sure for sure. Thanks for reaching out about that, Jean. That's really great. Um, also, um, Shelly from SPM asks, um, what are your thoughts about um, interdisciplinary programming mm. within the college and others? Oh, I love that idea. So, Jane, I think I've run one idea by you, Jane, haven't I, that involved certain other parts of uh, the Portland campus. Yeah, I, I, we have been doing some, and I think one of the, maybe not to speak for Shelley, but I think part of what has to happen is some advocacy around how graduate students working between inter, working interdisciplinarily, um, it makes sense for programs to do it because right now the funding doesn't follow the student at all. And so, for example, if sports product design said, yeah, sports product management students come on to this class, if they had to add faculty or do something, there isn't a structure now to do that. So we, we've all talked about that a lot because our faculty have seen so many different ways that they could be, um, that students would be interested in each other's classes, but 
haven't quite figured out the funding part. So we can talk more about that, but I don't know, Shelly, I don't want to speak for you if that was kind of what you were saying, getting at, or? Yeah, the, the heart is there, uh, the mechanism is not. So we, we see the value and we would like to be able to share resources and there have been, we've, we've made attempts where we're like, yes, okay, one student can come in and take this class, maybe two, and then, you know, but it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to have to say no to students who have an interest in just, um, so, the, if we can, as a university, if we can come to some decision on how to deal with the financial, uh, the financials, um, I know it will happen. We, we, we've already discussed how it could happen. We, we just have to get the financials in line. Yeah, so I mean, that's definitely a conversation we should continue having because there were a few uh, models that we were testing out at my last institution trying to overcome this very issue. And I'd be um, really, really excited to be able to brainstorm some of those ideas and share some of those ideas and see if they could translate over. Yeah, we'll definitely follow up with you. Okay, sounds good. Um, but internal to the college, we could also be doing things like that. So um, one of the, uh, uh, well, there were two actually programs that I was part of developing in my last role, but one of them was um, very interdisciplinary. And that was uh, an undergraduate degree in sustainable urban design. And what we did there was it was housed within landscape architecture, um, but it was populated with courses that already existed in other parts of the college as well. But the primary line came through landscape architecture um, and we had urban design courses that were already taking place in other parts. Um, and then it was also populated, um, and I've mentioned this to Patrick actually, Jane, uh, he liked the idea, it was populated by other kinds of courses from across the campus to form the gen ed requirement part of it. And the benefit of that was that if students took the course, say, say it was like, you know, the history of cities or something, right? Sustainability in cities in the history department. If our students from that program took that course, which was listed as part of the gen ed side of the, the program, um, history got all the SCH and the funding from that. And um, that was how we got around. That's, that's how we sort of created a mechanism where everybody could win because it was clearly they were enrolled in that, that particular course. So as a body in that seat, those folks uh, got the SCH for that. Um, and so that program now is uh, kicking off in the fall. I, I had it all up and running just as I finished up, just in time on the skin of my chinny chin chin. Um, these things always take a couple of years to get up and running because there's many layers of the institution that you have to sort of go through. And um, But, you know, I think it's really worthwhile because it really sets students up to be dealing more realistically with a lot of the wicked problems that the world is facing and is going to continue to face moving forward. Wicked problems are ones that are going to require a lot of different perspectives to help us solve them. Um, and, you know, other institutions like Stanford, for example, uh, are, are really working hard to try to create mechanisms that enable students to have these more transdisciplinary educational experiences for this reason. And employers are wanting students that are more literate in other areas as well. I think it's really important. We have two um, student related questions. One's from Melina Pastos. Um, she's a graduate student and is wondering if you have ideas about enhancing the student experience. Yeah, so we're talking enhancing the student experience um, in Portland or in uh, Eugene? Well, Melina's from Eugene. So I think maybe Eugene, um, she says that she was just in the creative placemaking class that you visited earlier today. Oh, oh, I'm so eager to find out the outcome of that. <laughs> but don't tell me, don't, don't like jump, what is it called? Jump the, the line on that one. I'm sure. eager, <laughs> eager to sort of find that out from Gerard later on, how that all went. But um, one of the main things I want to start with on enhancing the student experience is how does the dean have more access to, to hearing what students want? And so the way in which I would like to do that, and I, I've done this before and I found it worked well, was to have a dean student advisory council. And the Dean Student Advisory Council is made up of student leaders of the various student organizations. Um, and that's a group that I meet with once a month. 
Um, and it's a it's an informal meeting. It's one where folks are, you know, the idea is to relax, have a cup of tea and a biscuit um, or a cup of coffee and uh, to sort of chat about things that the students are doing, uh, things that they're aspiring towards, ways in which the dean's office can better help them. Um, and this is a really good way for me to have a more direct line to the student body um, and to sort of use the mechanisms of democratic representation to help me get there. So that's the first thing that I'm going to be doing in the upcoming year. Just a quick follow up, Dean Parr, I wanted to say thank you for that. But really my, my question was following along with what some of the other faculty have said. Our interviews in that course overwhelmingly um, pointed to the fact that students feel very siloed in their discipline or just hungering for this kind of interdisciplinary work that has already been discussed in the mm -hmm. um right so and, i mean yeah then that's a great question and i think you know what as i was pointing out before you can do it either programmatically firstly um or secondly the other point that i was making before which was about how do you infuse the research culture and what's going on in the research centers and institutes into the classroom experience. So I think that's another really good way of doing it. Thirdly, how do you create more experiential learning opportunities that enable students to get out of the classroom and out into the field or into the profession in some shape or form? And those are really the three primary mechanisms, I think, that can be used to enhance the, the student experience moving forward. So thank you for the follow-up question. <laughs> The other student question is around diversity of inclusion work in the school. Um, an example was given here, a group of LA students did uh, great work this past year and have lots of wonderful ideas to share. This is coming from um, Jean Senechel Biggs, who um, we had a question from before. Um, I think there's some good work maybe to share with you. Mm -hmm. Jean, are you still here? Yeah, yeah, hi, I'm here. There you are. <laughs> Yeah. Are they Do you want to speak a little bit more into that? I probably paraphrased it. Maybe. Um, not. Yeah. No. This. Um, there was a group of students um, really kind of, you know, following the events of last year, and they they took it upon themselves to really think about what um, what would an approach be for um, the department and even even broader to the school um, uh, around DEI. You know, there's. Um, there's a lot of white faces at the school. There's a lot of white faces on this call and there's such awareness around it. Um, and uh, they, they just, they did some very impressive work um, and, and reached out to alumni, reached out to faculty um, and uh, gathered just some really great ideas for things that could happen in the school. And, you know, hearing you talk about DEI work is, is needed as part of your strategic plan. And I just, um, reach out to them and, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll go back and find out their names. Hopefully at least one oh, of them has do. not yet graduated. Yeah. Um, uh, and if they have, I still probably have their, their U origin email. So, um, uh, yeah, they just did some really nice thinking about it. Um, I just don't know kind of where it, where it landed. I also know that, um, they were doing it in late summer and I'm sure they all got busy and caught up with school as the year went on. Um, but anyhow, they, they just, they had a, they had a nice, they did some really nice work there. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make you aware of that. Um, and then really the other sort of my, my other part of the question is just how can alumni and professionals, mm -hmm. um, help support that work? Um, cause we're also as professionals, um, wanting to see the diversity in the profession, um, it, you know, increase and, but we know that needs to happen by, it has to come up through the school and, um, we're all eager to see that change happen as well. So it's hard in Oregon, you know, where we, we struggle to, um, you know, attract um, diverse candidates and, and yet we all really wanna see, um, see that change, so. Mm -hmm. No, I really thank you for that question because that's an important one. And I think, you know, there are a variety of ways in which this can be tackled and I think you know, they should all be tackled in tandem in some senses. The first one is, you know, for minority students, access to the university um, becomes difficult when uh, they don't have the finances that enable them to attend university. So the first piece in that puzzle is being able to have more Jedi focused uh, uh, scholarships that are available for, for those students. So that's part of my development work, going out and seeing who is interested in supporting this kind of thing, recognizing that we're part 
we're, we're, we're hand in glove with you, Jean, with the profession uh, in terms of helping the profession diversify. And it starts with us, right? Because they've got to first go through uh, university and, and get their qualifications, but then they also need opportunities for training uh, out in the field um, in order to make them successful on the market when they, they finish with us uh, in the college. So how do we get more scholarships to support diverse students and recruit them? Uh, secondly, then whilst they're with us, how do we have opportunities for them to do internships, for example, that are paid internships uh, with firms? Maybe there are ways in which we could form partnerships uh, uh, with firms and other organisations for the, our, our minority students such that they're guaranteed summer work with an organization which then helps them with their fees when they go back to school for, for fall, winter and spring quarter. So these are some of the things that I looked at in my last position. And we ended up getting scholarships for minority students. And we ended up uh, creating um, real direct lines um, uh, with, with them out into the workforce. And so over summer, they were they weren't flipping burgers they were actually working for firms and then many of them ended up then working for those firms are there really talented diverse minority students that the firms want to serve as sponsors for um, and be part of um, helping them be successful in their education sponsoring them through that process and with the guarantee that when they come out they then work for the firm for a certain number of years years using the sort of Peace Corps model there, right? So, um, and we also do that with our teachers. Uh, there's ways in which teachers can get their education and then they enter into disadvantaged um, uh, school districts. And if they work there for a certain amount of time, then that can help them pay off their uh, tuition fees, right? So there's a variety of things that we can do in that way to help encourage them to come to us, be successful whilst they're with us, and then also provide an on-ramp for them once they finish with us. And then there's other ways in which we can be celebrating um, activities that are invested in um, enhancing issues of, of diversity, equity, inclusion. And I only just met the other day with the, the JEDI committee. I've renamed them the JEDI committee uh, so that it's justice, equity, diversity and inclusion. And um, ask that committee to start thinking about language that they will put together to create a new award that will come out of the Dean's office. Um, JEDI awards for our students whose projects are stellar projects um, that are dealing with, you know, the intersection of these issues as part of their project, whether it's an essay, a thesis, or a creative project, um, and that there would be, uh, you know, awards with a dollar amount associated with it that those students could win. So there's all kinds of things that we can do to both celebrate diversity in the, in the college and to attract more diverse students, and then also support them on their journey as they're uh, being educated with us and then out into the world at large. Thank you. We have one last comment and it's not really a question. It's from Robert Hastings. He says, I'm a huge proponent for applied research opportunities with the college and public agencies around urban issues. I'm very hopeful the college can strengthen these relationships through its alumni and professional associations. So I think that I'd kind of to meet up. On. Let's meet up <laughs> and let's talk about that more. Yeah. Yeah. So it's coming to 6 p.m. And Adrian, it's been a joy spending time together today. I wish you the best of luck in the role as our new Dean and really look forward to partnering with you on future endeavors. And we're so happy to have you at the University of Oregon. And the audience, thank you for attending on Zoom and participating. Like we should applaud you as well. Um, thank you so much. And I think what you should know is there's other events that the university sponsors throughout the year. And um, so make sure to check your email and website and our websites to see what's happening. And with that, I wish everybody a great evening. Thank you again, Adrian, and thank you all for attending. Thank you so very much. And Susan, thank you. You're very everybody welcome. Everybody has to check out the incredible research that this lady is doing <laughs> in sports product design. It's amazing. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.